February 9, 2019 started like any other day for Jamaican distance runner Kemoy Campbell. Before the day ended, he was battling for his life after his heart stopped. In his first full interview since, Kemoy met us in a hotel in New York to speak about his fears, his determination, and the way forward. Of course, Kemoy, I really must thank you for taking time to speak to us. Um, and I really couldn't start, brother, without asking you, how are you feeling? How are things? Um, feeling pretty good, actually. Um... I've definitely improved since I got out of the hospital and um, I think there's a lot more improvement um, to come but right now I'm just taking it easy and I'm feeling good so um, I'm trying to keep it that way for now. Let's be clear, your heart stopped for a few minutes, you're clinically dead. Um, how has that whole experience changed your life, changed your perspective perhaps? I mean, one of the things that I realize is when people tell me I think I'm more scared for my family members and um, friends and all that rather than myself because obviously, as you said, I was dead, so I didn't know what was going on. And then uh, when I hear about it, it's, it's, it's frightening to know that this happened and I put all my family through this. But at the same time, like the way it changed my life, I've gotten closer to my family, my friends I've tried to... Um, reach out to my friends more, try to keep in touch with people more. And actually, I, right now, I want to start this thing where I try to get people certified in CPR um, because it's something I'm going to do as well and even try to learn how to use that um, AED because it could save somebody's life in the end. Take us back to that day. It's February 9th. You were awake, you are getting ready for the Millrose games. Um, <laughs> was there anything that was different um, that particular day that suggested that things could go wrong? Strangely, no. Uh, my memory of that day is actually non-existent. The only thing I remember was talking to one of my friends heading to the um, track meet and I couldn't tell you what happened from there on. Uh, I just remember waking up in the hospital like a Monday morning and I looked over and I saw my girlfriend and she was obviously in tears and she said I keep asking what happened like where am I and um, she told me like I was in the hospital and I keep asking how is it Monday didn't I run Saturday or something um, so I have no memory of that day the only thing I remember is just being on the bus heading to the track. Uh, has there ever been an experience prior to this where you had any similar incident on the track? Um, no, um, in practice a few times I, um, I thought I had exercise induced asthma where I would be working out and obviously it's super cold so I'd be working out and I thought my body was just working extra hard where um, it's working hard to warm itself and also like to push in practice and I'd feel, I felt like I couldn't breathe in practice so I thought it was like a breathing problem and the Monday, I already scheduled an appointment to see like a doctor about my breathing the Monday and the incident happened the Saturday. So I, I didn't know, maybe it was my, something with my heart, I didn't know. Um, and after, the, after, what happened, after what happened Saturday, I'm starting to think maybe it was my heart affecting like my breathing or something like that. I couldn't get oxygen throughout my body. All right, so, yeah. so your, your pace setting for the men's 3000 inside the armory at the Millrose Games, at what point or did you feel anything at any point throughout the race that, that suggested that there's a problem? Funny enough, I couldn't tell you if I did because I, I don't remember anything about it. But if I was going based off practice, I would say, or based off like prior races, I would say um, chances are I felt the same way that I couldn't breathe. And that's when I decided, oh, something must be wrong. Mm -hmm. And this is all just me speculating here because of prior um, experiences. And that was at the 1,000 meter mark, about halfway, almost halfway in the race. Yes, that's what I heard. Wow. Um, what were your first thoughts, you know, when you regained consciousness um, in the hospital? <laughs> it was kind of weird at first, like, because the first thing I remember was some tube coming out of my mouth and this is because they intubated me and stuff and I was kind of scared because I, I didn't know what it was and I just saw this hand like just pulling this thing out of me and then when I am um, and obviously I was heavily sedated so 
I was in and out of consciousness same way. And the first memory I remember is when there was two of my brothers sitting there looking. And you could see on their, their face that they were kind of scared mm -hmm. because the doctor told him up, when I wake up, they don't know if I'll have like normal brain function. So they were sitting there like looking scared as hell. They didn't know what to expect. And finally, I said something to them and they, they started looking like a bit, not, I wouldn't say happy, but a bit more relaxed. Um, but my thought, <laughs> to be I, I couldn't tell you what my thought was because after I heard what happened, I think I was more like sad. There was so much emotional like feeling coming in. Um, I was sad, happy to be alive, but sad at the same time for my family members, scared. It was a just whole influx of emotion. There is an article in the Gleaner where one of our sports medicine professionals, Dr. Paul Wright, mm -hmm. um, estimated that you had a 50-50% chance of, of coming back. But from what you, you told me earlier before this <laughs> interview started, it was far less than that. Yeah. So the doctors here who are responsible for heart, like the, apparently one of the best like facilities in the country and in the world. Um, one of the Physio the electrophysiologist told me only 2% of people who this happens to gain back consciousness or have brain function. So when she told me that, I, obviously I was surprised. That's when I said to myself, someone was definitely watching out for me because otherwise I would be here talking to you right now. Right. Come on, one minute you're, you're an international record setting athlete. The next minute you are stretched out in a hospital bed battling for your life. I mean, what sort of emotions did that kind of bring to the fore for you? I think one of the one of the worst ones was it was very scary. It was very scary because and it even got scarier throughout my stay in the hospital because I was sitting there wondering what caused it. And up to this day, they can't tell me what caused it. All they told me was um, there's inflammation in my heart muscles. They don't know what caused the inflammation. Um, this hasn't been happening for long, so they don't really know why. They thought it was some kind of virus that I caught somewhere. But at the same time, they really don't know. So even up to this day, there's some, there's some tension between me and them because they, I, I see them as a doctor's expert who's supposed to know this, but at the same time, if I'm not getting any results, I'm just sitting in the dark basically, like thinking, if I do this again, am I going to put my family members through the same thing? They're scared for me to go back and run, but at the same time, it's my livelihood where I love running. I've been running for as long as I can remember. So. I just need answers and that's one of the scariest things I can think of, like not getting the answers. I don't know if I could do it again. And I say my family, my family means a ton, a lot to me. They mean a lot. And if they think it's going to put them in a situation where they have to go through all this heartache and pain all over again, I think I don't know if I might run again because I don't want to see them the same way that I saw them in the hospital. And as much as I love running, I mean, there's other ways I can get involved, which I've been thinking about even, even up till now, because the doctors told me, hey, um, right now just take the rest that you need. Um, they're giving me at least six months to rest. And then after that, they'll, I come back for the checkup, they'll tell me, hey, your heart looks like it's healed. You can start doing it slowly again. Like, start building up back into it um, but they haven't like really given me like any any straight answers as to yes you can do this but I, I think I still have a lot to offer I still have a lot to offer so I'm just holding out resting the best I can still doing my walks simple exercises that I can do and then I'll get back on it as soon as they tell me I can get back on it, if I can get back right. on it. So you have not given up um, the chance or the hope of one day competing again, you haven't? I haven't given up that chance because 
oddly as it sounds, I was thinking of moving up to the marathon, like, really? like a year down the road. I was thinking of doing that, and if if I could do that, like I mean, I wanna at least, I wanna compete at every level in every event, and I think the marathon would be the ultimate event for me. And if I end up running, I'm probably just gonna move straight back to the marathon, not even on the track anymore. Very interesting. I and mean, you have always shown, particularly through your um, collegiate years, that you do have a very wide range from the 800 meters yeah. to, to the 10k. So yeah. wouldn't be surprised if you recover and, 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 and attempt that. But just, just tell us, what would that mean to you if you're able to go through all of this, a life-threatening incident and come back and compete at that level? I mean, it would mean a lot to me. Like, I think, I always tell people when I started this, I didn't really start this for me. I started to prove to people in Jamaica, to young, like, young youths, that it's not only sprinters that can come out of Jamaica. And if I, if I can like, prove to them, like, hey, this is what happened to me, it was life-threatening, I am, well, basically I died and then came back and started competing again, like the best of my ability and I'm doing well in the sport. I think that will show them like, hey, like we're healthy and we have the, the, the opportunity to make something out of this and they'll go out and try their best as well. So I think, I think my, my goal is to help these, these kids and recognize that they have talent in other areas as well. Just a drug back, pun intended, a, a little bit. Um, did they say specifically how long your heart had stopped for? They didn't tell me that specifically because there was no doctors around. Okay. It was just uh, bystanders at first. And apparently, apparently um, they, the bystanders on the track got there fast, like, fast enough to administer CPR, yeah. which kept my brain intact. Yes. Um, but they didn't say specifically how long my heart stopped for. It's amazing too because I, I look at your Instagram account and I look at your posts since the incident and it amazes me how positive you have been <laughs> in a situation where yeah. your livelihood is yeah. being threatened, your life was almost lost, but you are still able to keep a smile on your face. What is it that keeps you going and keeps you in such a positive frame of mind? I mean, to think about it, I have life, right? I mean, it. It came so close to life being taken away from me. I've always been the type of person to try and smile in any situation. Um, I've always been that my smile can make someone else's day. And if I can like go about my day and make at least one person's day, that's an accomplishment for me throughout that day. So um, yes, I smile a lot. And that's because, I mean, I don't really, I don't, I don't want to walk around being serious all the time. I'm not that type of person. I'm a type of person like someone should be able to come up to me because I'm, I'm just a person you want to come up to based on looking at my face, smiling. I'm a happy person. I don't look miserable or unhappy all the time. And that's how I want, like, if, if for instance, if, I, if it had went the other way around, I want people to say that, yo, this is a kid that was always smiling, not someone who was always serious and um, locked off to the world, not talking to anybody or any of that. I want to be a friendly person where people can approach me and feel comfortable to talk to me. Was there any point where you felt that life was a bit unfair? I mean, you, 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 you eat well, I'd imagine, you train hard, but yet this particular situation happened to you. I mean, the worst is, for instance, sometimes when I go on Instagram and I see um, all these other runners running out there, sometimes I ask myself, like, why is it that they can run and I can't now? I mean, most of these guys, like, I used to beat in college, were beating me at some of the meets. And that's when I started realizing, like, yo, something's not right. Something's not right. But it was just, there were times I was just telling myself, like, hey, maybe you just need to work harder. Maybe you just need to work harder. And in practice, I, I would go on runs and work even harder. But I didn't know that it was something this critical like that was causing all that. So yeah, there's times when I say, yes, it's unfair because I'm a hard worker. And if I was 100% in every aspect, I would be like unstoppable. Most of these people wouldn't even be close to my talent. But at the same time, it, everything happens for a reason. That's how I look at things. Was there a point 
through throughout this entire ordeal where you felt that you wouldn't make it, where you would you would die? That's very hard to answer you know, because I think when I was out, because I didn't remember, I don't remember anything. I couldn't tell you how I felt, but there were times after when I was sitting in the hospital, like, and it was mostly like at night when I was by myself. I started thinking, what if I didn't? And it was, it was some of the scariest thoughts I've had because um, I started thinking like I'm 28 years old. I haven't, I don't, as much as I've accomplished, I feel like I haven't accomplished anything as yet. I um, feel like I haven't made as much impact in people's life as yet. And my family for sure, like it just scares me like thinking about leaving them behind. So even though I don't remember what was going through my head at that moment, I think it was probably the similar thoughts. If you are to return, have they given you a realistic target? I know you said six months and until you start doing light running again, but what would be a realistic target if you get the green light? <laughs> well, if anyone knows, if you know me, you know that like when I started training, I don't really play around with training. You can ask Mr. Tomlin from Belfield, my coach is from South Plains College, my coach from Arkansas, now my coach from, coach from Boston and my coach in Charlottesville right now. I push myself really hard. And if they do give me the go-ahead, at least this time I'm going to be a little bit more cautious. But, I mean, I'm going to try to get back around as quickly as I can while being as safe as I can as well. So, there's not a realistic target that they have given me, but at the same time, I think I might set some of those targets for myself and say, hey, at this point, like maybe one month down the road, I want to be able to run eight miles at most or one month down the road six miles at most without feeling like I'm tired mm -hmm. so there's goals that I've set for myself and I guess when the moment comes I'll just have to figure out how to adjust those and just work with what my body can give me so the program right now is mostly rest they've told me that um, hey you can re just make sure you rest don't go out and run um, I've been walking and they try to encourage me to walk like further not every day but like I try to walk like every day. If I can't do the, the most I've walked so far is like a mile point two. And I can't walk that fast, but it's still me going longer at the end of the day. And I think just keeping that mentality would definitely help me reach somewhere even further, like in the future or something. But your experience has raised a lot of concerns, a lot of talking points about athletes' health. Um, do you believe that most athletes or some athletes take for granted that they are healthy just because they are fit? Do you think <laughs> they pay enough attention um, to their health? No, I don't think so. I think the most athletes are going to tell you like, hey, I go out and I run this much per day and I do this much. But at the same time, you're still, you're still just a human being. And this is where I probably messed up. Um, that's where I was telling myself, maybe I just need to push through a little bit more instead of going to the doctor and realizing, hey, you're a human being, you feel pain just as everybody else feels pain. You, um, XP, you get thirsty just as everybody else get thirsty. So you need to check your body, check, get checked up from the doctor like regularly just as everyone else. And I think most at least neglect that, hey, they need to do this and I don't think they focus on their health like internal health, mental health, even as normal people do. Because they think, because their physical health is so good, maybe they don't need to do the rest. Let's talk about athlete insurance. Um, there has been a debate, and it has again been brought to the fore since your incident internationally, that meat promoters, um, kit sponsors, federations and so forth should pay greater attention to providing insurance for athletes. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think it's a great thing if they actually do it because obviously when I end up in the situation, I had to go through GoFundMe to try and raise some money to help pay for the expenses. Um, thankfully enough, 
um, Reebok has um, offered some um, financial support. Um, the sports minister has offered some financial support. Um, I haven't received any of the bills as yet, but I think they'll, Jamaica said they'll help me out. But I think in order for some athletes to compete with the peace of mind, with a peace of mind, I think most of these meets and most of these like um, even their sponsors could at least help them get some form of insurance because yeah, you're, the athletes are making money, but what if you decide, hey, I'm gonna, this is how it's gonna work. We're gonna pay you this amount, but we're gonna have insurance for you. All we're gonna do is take out like maybe a $200 out of your pay and put towards the insurance. It takes less of the athletes. All the athletes have to do is just compete now. They don't have to worry about insurance. They don't have to worry about their health. Like if something happens, they have to find money to pay for it or so. But I think that would be a good idea if they actually come together and like figure this thing out and figure out how they can help the athletes. Yeah, and at every meet, right? Yeah. You have this sort of medical support readily available. Um, is this something too that we and other developing countries, countries that perhaps might not have um, the sort of facilities and resources, is this something that we need to really look into and take more seriously? I think it's definitely something that we need to take more seriously. One of the things that I, um, I want to be an advocate to is people learning CPR, people learning to use an IED, because these are the two things that save my life, save my brain from being damaged. And I think this is something that I want to learn. And I think it, now I hold it like too dearly to, to me. And I think if I, can, if I can influence people to go out and do the same that I'm trying to do, I think it will benefit a lot of people in Jamaica. For instance, a person, if, if someone knows CPR, they could probably keep the person's brain intact until the, the ambulance arrives and those guys can get to work, shot the person back, just like what happened to me. And I think, um, as I say, it takes like a whole village to raise a kid, probably it takes a whole village to keep someone alive. And I think um, if everyone knows a little bit how to help others, then it goes a long way. Uh, you have been through a lot, um, Kemoi. Do you now feel that, I know you said that there are things that you want to do, you still want to do on the track. Do you also feel that there is some sort of higher calling where you're concerned? <laughs> That's a very good question. I think there is. Um, and I honestly think it's probably to educate people about this whole thing about like taking care of yourself learning like the basic like techniques to keep somebody else alive um, and that's one of my focus right now and I think that's something I really really want to focus on pour all my energy into this no matter where if it's in America Jamaica in different Caribbean countries it doesn't matter where I have to go to let people know these things and in I think in Jamaican high schools this is something that they should know like, coaches definitely should know how to do CPR. They should definitely know how to like use an AED if there's one in, in um, the high school because these are athletes, athletes are just as vulnerable as everybody else. Mm -hmm. And if it happens that, if the same incident happens to an athlete in high school, I think the coaches should know how to keep that person like alive until the ambulance can come and get them and they rush to the hospital or something. So. Educating people about this, definitely one of the calling for sure. Fearful of a repeat? Are you fearful that this might happen again? I am fearful that this might happen again. I'm fearful for myself, I'm fearful for like the, my loved ones, friends, everyone. Fearful that it might happen again. But at the same time, they did put in a, um, a def yeah, defibrillator, portable defibrillator in my body. So. If it does happen again, this thing will help to shut my heart back into like really. So there is the, this is an insurance and that's what they told me because they couldn't figure out what was going on so they decided to give me an insurance so I could go home and know that this might protect me in case of anything. No, we don't mean to be intrusive, mm -hmm. um, but you did mention that you have not seen any of the medical bills and so we know it's going to be an exorbitant cost, <laughs> but is there any idea 
right now what it will cost um, to get you over the hill? I have no idea. Um, all I heard when I was in the hospital that it's pretty expensive. And even though I know um, I had to stay there to figure everything out, I kind of wanted them to just get me out of there because I know each day I was in the hospital. That's more money adding up, more money adding up, more money adding up. And I really don't know what the, I really don't know what the bill is going to cost, but I know probably when I see it, I might <laughs> see it. But <laughs> yeah, so there are no more complications so, yeah, yeah. when you actually see the bill. Um, but I mean, to that, to, to, to that, to that point, um, of course, there, there, there has been a lot of support coming from Jamaica. Um, what would you like to say to the people who have contributed to the GoFundMe account, who have sent you messages via social media, have reached out to you in, in many other ways? Honestly, I just want to say thanks to them because if, if it wasn't for them, I don't know where, where I'd get all that money or anything to help me pay for the hospital. And I just think at the end of the day, people just went above and beyond. And not only financially, but emotionally, they, they reached out, tried to help me to like just, just get, get my head back into thinking I can get to a point where I can compete well, I can recover 100%. And I think that, that definitely helped for sure. I'm surprised that so many persons cared? I was actually surprised. Um, the amount of people that reach out to me, like, it, it kind of had me thinking, at first, obviously, any athlete will tell you this, they might think people might forget, ab for, like, forget about them because they're not competing well. But after all this happened, I know it's like tragic and everyone wants to reach out, but at the same time, they didn't have to. They didn't have to. They chose to like, reach out and like, make sure like, I felt like people cared. And that's one of the things that kind of helped me to get through the hospital for sure because there were times I'm sitting there and I'm thinking I'm just here by myself in the hospital. I can't sleep well. I'm sleep deprived. I can't think straight because I know what happened. I know how my family had to deal with it. And just going through my phone and looking at people saying, recover well, speedy recovery, praying for you, all, that, all these things, it just helps to, just to bring me through that. You have several outdoor and indoor national records. Um, you have represented Jamaica at the Olympics. You are still the only Jamaican male to compete in a World Championships final. Mm -hmm. If you were to close or end your um, career um, this year, what would be the biggest disappointment for you from an achievements perspective on the track? I mean, the biggest disappointment would be not meddling in one of these events. Um, that's one of the goals that I set out with. And if you go back as far as some of the interviews that I've had, you will realize that this was something that was mentioned a lot of times. I want to be the first Jamaican to medal in a distance race for, um, for Jamaica. And that would be one of the disappointments. But I think at the same time, I've left a mark in the sport and I think if I can share my experiences with some people in Jamaica, with some of the youths, and I think it might lead Jamaica to great things as well because they realize, I mean, it takes hard work, but in anything you're doing, if you have passion for it, hard work just seems, it doesn't seem like hard work. What's going to be the greatest challenge for you going forward and how prepared are you mentally to deal with that? Mentally, I've, honestly, I've gotten stronger mentally. I mean, there are times when you might have a mental breakdown and say, am I going to do this again or anything? But I think mentally, when it comes to exercising and getting back up there, I have that, um, I have that drive to get myself back in it as fast as I can. Um, and I think the toughest thing is going to be like knowing I'm not going to get there as fast as I want to. I have to be patient. But I have family and friends around and I know they're gonna they're gonna help me to get through this process for sure.